Welcome to What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast. I'm your host, Dan Kidder. Our podcast is all about issues facing Southern Utah. Here, we will announce your upcoming events, talk with movers and shakers in our community about important issues facing Beaver, Iron, Kane, and Washington counties, and make sure that you are kept in the loop with interesting news and commentary of local interest. While we welcome folks from all over, our goal with this podcast is to give residents of Southern Utah a place to find out about issues that affect them. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and also on our Facebook group, What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, and online at whatsreallyhappeningsu.com. Hi, this is Dan Kidder, and we are here with What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast. And today we have a special topic that we want to discuss with everybody. Uh, As you're starting to receive your ballots in the mail, you're going to notice that there is a bond issue on the ballot regarding the county commission uh, having a a general obligation or geo bond for the construction of a new jail. Uh, So that is one of the issues should the county commission uh, be able to get an 89 and change million dollar bond for the construction of a new jail. So joining me here today in the studio, I have County Commissioner Mike Blake, who has been the uh, member of the County Commission who has spearheaded this. His area is law enforcement. And also I have Ken Carpenter, our sheriff. Even though he's 25 years old, he has centuries worth of experience in law enforcement. (laughs) And that's what happens when you're in the Marine Corps. Um, And and Mike himself also has been a law enforcement officer for a few decades. Coming up on 28 years. Yeah. So pretty quick. We got a lot of law enforcement experience in this room today. uh, And we're going to talk about why this issue is coming up on the ballot, uh, what's going on with our current jail, and the needs of this community as far as a jail goes. So, gentlemen, I appreciate you coming in. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having us. So, the, the, the jail that we currently have is the oldest in the state. Correct. And it's fallen apart. It is. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's 37 years old, uh, as you said, oldest in the state. And, you know, we've got a number of issues with it. Uh, Our air handler units on the roof are are rusted through, which allows leaking through the roof uh, anytime we have a a heavy rainstorm. Uh, Our HVAC heating ventilation system is so old that they don't make it anymore, so our our maintenance facilities folks have to purchase products off of eBay in order to keep it up and running. The sewer is uh, the old cast iron uh, sewer lines under two feet of concrete and are rusting out, uh, allowing leakage underneath the gel. Raw sewage. Raw sewage. We've got uh, our basement is basically on the same level as the city sewer out on Main Street. So anytime it rains hard enough to overwhelm the sewer system, we have sewage that backs up into the gel as well. Uh, those are some of the fiscal things. And, and some of those, if we wanted to dump a lot of money into a pig, we could do that. Uh, the air handler units, for example. But the fact of the matter is, is we've completely outgrown the current facility. Uh, it has 254 beds, but because of the environmental design of it, and with the uh, classification requirements that are placed on us for separating classifications of inmates, we can only effectively use 180 of those beds. So those classifications are things like members of different gangs can't be housed together. Right. Females can't be housed with males, obviously. Transgender. Transgender. All those types of things. All those types of things. Uh, You know, those all play a role in it. you we've, have an issue with people on suicide watch too, don't you? Well, we do, and you know, and I mean, we've we've literally, before I address that, we've literally used every space available to us for housing areas. We've taken all of our our supply closets, turned them into housing areas. We've turned our gymnasium into housing area, and we're just completely out of room. So, going to what you were just talking about, Dan, is is you know, uh, we have to use our booking area that has four cells for not only bringing inmates in and transitioning them from uh, being arrestees from out on the street into the general population, 
but also have to use those spaces for suicide watch. And, you know, we had, uh, like I say, four cells in, in the booking area. We had eight people on suicide watch three weekends ago. So is that, uh, that booking area, in? is that the drunk tank? The drunk tank. Yeah, and you come in if you're intoxicated, the, they got to sober you up first. It's the intake area. And, so and what do you do if you have all of those cells full with well, and that's, suicide watch? And that's part of the problem is, is what do we do? Uh, you know, we've... We're using the Bell Bondsman's booth, you know, for overflow. We're using a bathroom for overflow. We just don't have the space. We're, we've outgrown the facility. I've heard that there are storage closets that have beds in them now. Correct. We've, we've literally taken any sizable space that has been available to us within that facility and have turned it into a housing area. How have we not been sued for civil rights violations yet? Well, that's a good question, and, and uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to we try to manage our, our jail population the best we can, which means going back to the courts and asking the courts to take lower level offenders and releasing them back out on the street. So you're letting criminals go on the street. We are. Because you don't have any place to put them. Correct. What does that do to the crime rate in the community? Well. Uh, the county attorney told us here just a couple of weeks ago that currently they're prosecuting about 17% higher crime rate than they have in past years. And that's mainly for reoffenders? I believe so. Wow. And, and I guess that, I, I, I've heard you say that that tells the criminals that this is the level of criminality that we're willing to accept? Exactly. You know, when we, when we don't have a bed space for every offender that's been sentenced to jail time, you know, my deputies, police officers can all tell you that they have come across offenders that have told them, you can't take me to jail, they're not going to accept me. Even if you take me in and book me in, I'm going to be back out before you're done with your paperwork. And it's true. This reminds me of when California decriminalized shoplifting under a certain dollar amount. They'd go in and they'd shoplift up to that dollar amount. Right, and they would just ransack the stores, and and then they go to another store and do the same thing, and yeah. So you you talk about accepting a certain level of criminality that definitely seems to be what we're we're aiming for. Well, so we've got a broken down facility, a worn out facility. You can't get parts for the facility. You've got rusting pipes. You got sewage, and then you've got an overflowing facility. Yeah. It was made for four female inmates? Correct. When it was originally designed, it was designed for four female inmates. Currently, we're housing anywhere between 24 and 40 female inmates as a normal uh, occupancy. Uh, you know, there for a long time, we had them in that same area that was originally designed for four females. And we had what we call boats. They're basically a mattress with a side on it that we placed on the floor and had female inmates sleeping on the floor. They had one shower that was available to them. One shower for 40, one shower female, for 40 inmates. female inmates. That's got to get yeah. ripe. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, 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 it means that the shower is in constant use. Um, you know. What happens it, if there's a maintenance issue with that shower? <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and that's, those are, those are part of the problems. What we ended up doing was moving them into basically an open squad bay uh, where we converted the gymnasium into a housing unit. We put 40, uh, 40 beds, uh, bunk beds, 20 bunk beds in there. And that's where the, the female housing unit is now. But going back to the classification requirements, we're very restricted on, on the classifications. How do we classify these females? We have really one space available for them. And uh, unless it's a a very severe classification, you know, we just don't have any place to, to send them other than basically solitary confinement. Now, the, the big thing I love hearing people say is, well, you stop locking up people for using pot. Yeah. Well, and, and, and we don't. We don't. Uh, you know, my, my deputies make traffic stops every single day and cite and release several people a day for possession of marijuana. So they're not even being brought and in they're and not even and They're not even being brought in and booked anymore. Uh, you know, there are other drug crimes, but the Justice Reinvestment Initiative that was passed in 2015 
which also, by the way, encouraged people, criminals, to come to Utah. Uh, you know, that really declassified a lot of the drug crimes and has caused the jails to basically have a revolving door on them uh, because they're lower level crimes. But something people need to keep in, in mind is a lot of times these people that have drug addictions can't hold down a job, but they, they still have a drug addiction. They still have a need. And so they're going to commit property crimes or other type of, of criminal enterprise in order to fund that drug habit. And when those are the lower level crimes that are being released back out on the street, then they're re-victimizing our community. They're continuing in the same manner that they have for years of going out and committing property crimes, of committing other types of, of of criminal enterprise in order to uh, support their their drug addiction. I was talking to Chief Adams the other night and he told me that we have now some Vagos and some Mongols and some other gangs that are confirmed moving into this area trying to start yeah. chapters. Yeah, the, um, the so Mongols you're... have just recently started a chapter down in Hurricane and we believe that we have some here in Cedar City uh, that are are associated with that chapter, but, you know, are they trying to uh, start another chapter here in Cedar City? Well, we don't know just yet. So but but we're, we're they're, not they're just here. talking now about higher property crimes. We're talking about hardcore criminals. Hardcore. We've had two uh, drive-by shootings, one Correct. of a vehicle, one of a home. Um, we've got well, gang activity going well, that, on. We had two drive-by shootings on a home, t two separate incidents on the same home, and then the same uh, perpetrators ambushed another male in a vehicle out in the Three Peaks area and shot his vehicle to pieces. And this is essentially gang on gang it was crime. Gang, gang on gang crime. So we've got an overflowing jail. We're letting people go. We've got rising criminality going on with the influx of new people, 30% growth. You're going to have, you know, a corresponding increase in crime. Mike! Yes, sir. Why has this taken so long to get to this point? If we've needed this jail for so long, why are we just now getting around to it? Well, that's a great question. Um, so when I came onto the commission, I came in, I was elected into the commission in 2016. Uh, and my background before that is in law enforcement. I, you know, cumulative here in Iron County, I've been a law enforcement officer for almost 28 years. And I've seen the condition of the jail kind of deteriorate, but yet that wasn't necessarily my lane of travel. Uh, but when I got into the commission in 2016, Sheriff Gower at the time grabbed me and he's like, look, we've got to have a new jail. Uh, and, and so we so, started... So Sheriff Carpenter didn't just make all this up when he came into office? No, it's... No. No. <laughs> no is a short answer. Uh, so Sheriff Gower and I really sat down in earnest back then and started to talk about the issues and, and what was going on. And, and at about that time with the other commissioners then, uh, we sat down and said, okay, this, this needs to happen. We need to start looking at property. We need to start looking at feasibility. And we did. We started looking at property, I, I'm going to say probably in about 2017, uh, 2017, 18. Uh, we actually identified several areas of the county for potential properties and got with the master's degree program, the master's of public administration program at SUU as a project to have them do a feasibility study on these different areas. And we gave them criteria of, you know, closeness to the hospital, uh, utilities, uh, close uh, you know, proximity to the courts and different things. And we, we turned this over to their master's program to just do a basic feasibility study. And they came back and said, everywhere you're looking is bad. Uh, either you have no, uh, you have no uh, infrastructure uh, or you're way too far away from the courts, you're way too far away from the hospital. So really everywhere we started to look at that point wasn't a viable option. And so that all kind of went away. Uh, but at that time, Dan Jessen, who was our auditor, at the time, he was elected the same time I was in 2016. Uh, at that point, we had been able to pay off all of our general obligation bonds uh, in the county. We, we had a bond 
oh, on, on the courthouse and, and a couple of different things, small bonds, not anything like a, a jail bond. Uh, but with the, uh, with the income and revenue coming into the county, we were able to go back and pay off all of those bonds and basically leave the county debt free at that time. Um, Dan, knowing that we would have a fund balance, but you couldn't just carry an unlimited fund balance, knowing that we were going to need a jail eventually, said, let's start putting away money now for the jail. So when it comes time to actually, you know, get serious about building it, we've got a down payment basically. Uh, so between then and now, uh, we were able to save about $20 million uh, to use basically as a down payment uh, for the jail. Um, we really tried in earnest a couple of years ago. Uh, we found, we started with one piece of property out in the Smead area. Um, we had a lot of public, public outcry about that area, uh, which really turned out to be a good thing because once we really got, once we really looked at that area and the soils and things in that particular piece of property, they weren't great. It was going to cost us several million dollars just in excavation and compacting and backfill, stuff like that, to make that a feasible area. So we walked away from that area. Uh, after that, uh, we were directed towards the North Interchange, uh, an area there. Um, again, a lot of public outcry in that area because of you know a, a need and want for retail space and for for housing space. An area that's very close to where the current jail is already. Yes. Yeah. Very close. Um, ultimately, that didn't work out. Uh, at that point, we put together a public committee. Uh, to look for places to put the jail. Um, we included folks from the areas that we'd looked at before. Uh, we, we put uh, city councilmen, uh, different representatives from all the police departments in the county, uh, as long as, you know, private citizens. Uh, and it was one of our citizens that actually found the current property uh, back in the industrial area, kind of by the airport, and yeah, right behind Horse Alley. Horse Alley. Yeah. Uh, and it was interesting because it wasn't listed for sale, but they'd actually done some some legwork and went and said, are you guys, you know, the, the current property owners, to find out if they were willing to maybe negotiate that. Turns out that they were already in negotiations with another company to buy that whole piece. Uh, we went and met with that other company uh, to see if they what their plans were for that piece, and they were willing to break off that portion of the back. So uh, we were able to uh, ultimately make a deal on that portion of the property where we ended up buying. Uh, the soils are great. The drainage is great the uh, proximity to the hospital, to the courts and everything is very central uh, and all the utilities are stubbed in right there. So ultimately we were able to save you know, several million dollars by, by choosing that property and there's no adjacent uh, residential pieces anywhere. And there, there was a lot of questions from people about why don't you just build it way out in the West Desert where there's nothing around it and it, it will be cheaper land and you know there was there was some infrastructure concerns with Absolutely. that but also time concerns with that sure right? they then the infrastructure was big I, I mean if we've got to do i mean we can't put a jail on a septic system you'd have to have an awfully big septic system uh we would you know we were looking at having to build sewer lagoons and and things like that that just weren't practical uh, another huge concern was accessibility from our outlying departments. Uh, talk about Brian Head and Perwin, just for instance. You know, if Brian Head Marshal's office arrests somebody in Brian Head and brings them to jail, that's, you know, a, a, at least a two hour, if not a two and a half to three hour round trip as it is. Uh, putting and those them, departments are small. They small, don't have a lot of officers. Many times you're, you're being covered by one officer. So basically, you know, if you arrest a DUI at midnight in Brian Head, most likely you're the only officer on duty and that's gonna take you away from Brian Head and any police response for two to three hours. Uh, same with Perilyn. Uh, 
even the sheriff's office, you know, if you arrest somebody on Cedar Mountain or in the borough area, it's a significant transport time. That well, I heard during the county commission race that there's only three deputies on at any given time, <laughs> and, and that's not true, right? <laughs> no, it's not, uh, generally speaking. But there are periods of time where we may only have two deputies on. You know, they're typically relatively short periods of time. Uh, with shift overlaps and different things like that. But there are times that we only have two deputies on at a, at a given time. So if a bus made out in Medina someplace, that, ought, that, that deputy would be out of service for hours. For and literally. there'd be no coverage literally. out in Burl Enterprise in that area. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Well, I mean, you've told us what's wrong. You've told us why we need it. You've told us how we've gotten here. Now we're looking at an $89 million bond. And I've heard that everybody's property taxes are going to double. Is that true? No. Um, that was a very confusing piece of information uh, that went out. Uh, originally, uh, we looked at a truth and taxation model of, of raising property tax to do this. When you do that, uh, the state basically controls the information that goes out. The form that was sent out to everybody in Iron County is from the State Tax Commission. We didn't have any wiggle room on how that goes out, and it's very confusing. So if you look at, so if you look at a pie chart. Uh, I'll actually insert the pie chart here. Excellent. Uh, the county is the tax collector for all of the different entities in the county. Well, that's the school district, the water conservancy district, uh, all of the municipalities. Um, so every, each of those entities gets a piece of that pie. What we're talking about doubling is the county's levy, the general fund levy, which is about 10% of the total taxes collected. So really the thing that was going to double was that slice of the pie that was 10%. So uh, going from 10% to about 19% was what that was. Since then, we've determined that we're going to go the route of a general obligation bond for several different reasons. And that's the issue that's on the ballot. That's the issue that's on the ballot now. Number one, uh, it's, it puts it in the hands of the people, puts it in the hands of the voters, number one, to make that decision. Number two, we get better rates with the bond. The, the, actual, uh, the actual levy to the taxpayer is less than if we were to go through with truth and taxation. Uh, the interest rates are better on that bond, and it's a more, we have more flexible terms to pay off early, and to do those type of things. And you get the, the cheaper rate because you're required to pay that back first. You're required to pay that back first. And a lot of people are confused. They say, well, you know, we, that money's going to go into the general fund. How do we know that it's not just going to be spent everywhere else? In the, in the case of a geo bond, uh, it, it does go into the general fund, but there are lots of different accounts within the general fund. This is actually a separate account that the money sits in there and can be can do nothing but pay on that bond. It's, it's like the, Social Security. That has to be paid, whereas yes. the other stuff is a little Yeah, flexible. those funds cannot be intermingled. That chunk of money is there solely to pay the bond. And so we're able to get a better interest rate. We're able to get a, you know some better terms on that because it's a guaranteed uh, payment every year. So the, the tax that people pay is not going to double. What no. is the impact going to be to the average property taxpayer. Okay, with the general obligation bond that's on the ballot, the, uh, the average home, and this is stupid, but the average property in Iron County is $405,000. Uh, an average home of $405,000 is going to see an increase of about $153 a year. That's about $12.75 a month. So two lattes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Two Starbucks lattes. <laughs> basically, yes, and and, and that's good. And, and and people need to understand that that's the very most that it can ever be. It it can't ever go above that. Uh, with fluctu fluctuating rates and stuff, that bond will that payment will most likely be a little bit lower than that. 
and you know moving down the road we do have some some things in place that are going to help pay that bond down quicker or mitigate some of that that hopefully the, the the county commission is going to have some wiggle room in being able to lower that levy well we know that forward. one of the, one of those things that is going to help pay for that is sheriff carpenter is going to go round up a bunch of people and uh, charge them and throw them in jail with his jackbooted thugs <laughs> and then we're going to charge the state uh, for their rent right isn't that how that works <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, tell us how that contract issue actually works. Well, you know, the, both the federal government and the state government rely heavily on sheriff's offices around the state and around the nation to provide their extra bed space uh, to house state and federal inmates. Um, you know, and we're already paying for that. And we're already paying for that. As, as taxpayers, there's a piece of your taxes that is already being taken out to house those federal and those state inmates. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had people tell me, well, it's unethical for us to, to make money. Well, why? Why is that unethical? The fact of the matter is, is you're already paying that tax to house those people. And that tax is going someplace in this state and across the nation to house state and federal inmates. So what is wrong with bringing some of that ma money back to help stimulate our economy and to return some of those tax dollars back to our community? And uh, the fact of the matter is, is I get a lot of, of misunderstanding and pushback from people saying, we don't want those contract inmates, their families are gonna fall, it's gonna cause our crime rate to skyrocket. The fact of the matter is, is all that is absolutely untrue. Uh, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of people from California that says, well, this happened where we live. Well, guess what? This isn't California. This is Iron County, and we don't do things the way they do in California. Thank God. Okay? We don't allow in-person visitation. All of our visitation is done on tablets. So their families visit them from the comfort of their own living rooms on tablets. Uh, Occasionally, you'll have somebody that's not really familiar with technology that will come into the jail for a visitation. But again, that's done on a tablet that's provided out in the lobby uh, with that particular inmate. So as a result, we don't have those people follow their families to where they're at. The other part is, as I, I just saw a thing on Fox News today, where a gentleman said that, that these inmates were going to be released on the streets of, of Cedar City. Again, absolutely untrue, completely unfounded. All those inmates are returned to the county where they were arrested on a state inmate basis, are returned to the, the county where they were arrested, and that's where they're released. They're not released here in Iron County unless they're a state inmate that was arrested in Iron County and belongs to Iron County. And I think a lot of people misunderstand the difference, because you hear it when they talk about it, between a jail and a prison. This isn't a prison. Absolutely not. So you don't have those inmates for a very long period of time. Yeah, yeah it depends. So with the federal inmates, the federal inmates were really a temporary layover. Uh, we typically have federal inmates uh, 60 to 90 days. And the reason is, is because they've been convicted of a crime, but they haven't been sentenced yet. And so they come here as a temporary layover until they're sentenced. Once they're sentenced, then the U.S. Marshals take them to their federal penitentiary where they're going to serve the bulk of their time. With the state inmates, it works a little bit different. The state inmates come here... Uh, because of programming that we offer. So, for example, we have a GED program, we have a high school diploma program, we have a culinary food program, different things like that. So, the state inmates want to come to our facility for a specific program that we offer. Same thing with the other jails across the state, is they offer different programming. And they'll, they'll go to those those facilities for that programming. What that does is a couple things. Is one, is it gives us 
inmates that are actually very well behaved because they recognize that if they mess up, we don't have to keep them. We turn around and send them right back to the state. So the inmates that come here to be part of that programming come here because they want to be able to be a part of that programming. They want a chance of, of bettering their lives and giving them a road of hope when they, when they are released from prison. But again, they're not released from our jail. If, they're, if their time is fully served here, once their time is fully served, we don't release them. We ship them back to the, pen, the prison where they came from, and then the prison releases them to the county where they were arrested, not us. And, and the federal inmates, I mean, we're talking about a lot of accountants. We're not talking about guys that are holding up banks and, you know, <laughs> a lot of uh, blue collar, white collar criminals that are on the federal system. Well, and they, you know, on the federal system, it can be a lot of different things. I mean, there can be some pretty violent felons. But again, we don't have a problem with them because they haven't been sentenced yet. And so, you know, the, the judge is still holding a great big hammer right over the top of their heads. And if they come in and act the part of the fool, then that gets reported back to the judge, and the judge is going to take that into consideration when uh, he or she sentences them to the to their prison term. So when we get them, they're very well behaved. But again, same, same thing as with the state. If we have one that wants to be a knucklehead and, and wants to create problems, we don't have to keep them. Well, we I mean, can, they escape from the jail all the time, though, right? Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> you know, How many you know, escapes have you had uh, in the history of this jail? In the, in the history of this jail, one. And, and when it was, when that particular inmate escaped, it was because in the outside courtyard, they hadn't put the mesh over the yard yet, and there was a, uh, there was a basketball backboard there. And he just wanted to show them that he could escape. And so he jumped up, grabbed hold of the rim, climbed up on top of the backboard, went over the wall, and went out and sat on the front lawn and waited to be put back into the jail. One inmate in 37 years and that was solved as soon as they put the, the mesh <laughs> over the top. And he of did it to, say, to show he could. And, and also, also, by the way, they, they removed the backboard. There's no basketball anymore. <laughs> so, I bet he was popular. I'm sure that. he was. <laughs> <laughs> so this thing's going to cost $89 million. That's a chunk of change. Why, why <laughs> is it so expensive? And, and why can't we just get some grants for this? So you're, you're right, you're right in a way. Uh, so the, the bond that we're asking is up to $89 million. Uh, hopefully it will be a little bit less than that, but this is actually about a $100 million program. But like I said before, we've got $20 million in the bank. Uh, we've been able to purchase the property with that. We've been able to do all of the pre-construction design, architecture, that's all been able to come out of that $20 million. So we're really far ahead on the project as far as the design and being shovel ready without having to, had to go to the taxpayer and ask for anything. Um, man, the, the easy answer is jails are expensive. Uh, there's very few companies in the nation that are qualified to build jails. Uh, this, you know, the, everything has to be ADA compliant. They have to be compliant with all the, the federal corrections department. And there's security uh, concerns too, right? It's security. not like building an office building. It's not like building an office building. Everything is hardened. All of the, you know, all of the surfaces of inmates have, have hardened grout. They're concrete, they're steel. Uh, they're just very expensive to construct. Lots of camera security systems, you know, a lot of access that, control systems. Right. There, there's just a lot of technology that goes into a modern facility. Now, this facility is designed to, right now to be a two pod system. Correct. A pod's about 300 inmates. 362. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I've heard uh, is that based upon how they're designed in a circular fashion with little pie wedges that you can put. 24 inmates in each of those pie wedges. Correct. But also you can see from one control center everything going on on that floor. That's correct. So you don't have to have as many deputies. Yeah, so to give you an example, right now in my current facility, technically I have four control rooms. We use three of those control rooms. 
And your bed's you, in the other one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, so we have three control rooms for 180 inmates. Okay. We can have one control room for in excess of, you know, I don't know what it is. A hundred and something on each floor? It, it's it's 200 on the main floors. It's 200 and something yeah, on but the main it, floor. I mean, I mean, it's just so much more it, of an efficient It's so much design. more efficient. And, and, and there's no blind spots. In my current facility, the environmental design of the current facility, even from our observation posts, we can't see every part of those housing units. We have blind areas which becomes dangerous to the inmates and it becomes dangerous to our staff. You know, with, with the new design, with these uh, circular pods, there are no blind spots. We can see everything in all those common areas. The only thing that we can't see is in the cell itself. But when we go up to the cell on our tear checks, then we can look through the glass and see that entire cell and see what it is that we're dealing with. And those of those cell. control rooms, they the people in them don't ever have any contact with no. the inmates, so they don't necessarily have to be police officer standard and training post right. certified, right? Correct. So that could actually lower the cost of those individuals. It could. It could. So why why can't we get a grant for this? So <clears throat> there's lots of grants out there for parks and recreation and. All those things, there are zero grants available uh, to build correctional facilities. I mean, we have, we have gone the state route, the federal route. We, I mean, we have exhausted every search for any type of funding. Uh, one source of funding that's always been pretty reliable in the state is, is CIB funding. And that's Community Infrastructure. Community Infrastructure Board, I believe is what it stands for. There's so many acronyms, but the, yeah, the Community Infrastructure Board, that money is derived from fossil fuel uh, proceeds going to the state and then that comes back out. Well, uh, our fossil fuel production has been shut down for the most part, you know, over the last several years. And so there's very little money trickling into that CIB funding. And so when we went to CIB to, to, to look at potential funding, there just isn't any available. Have you tried housing and urban development? <laughs> <laughs> it's housing? It's housing. <laughs> it's housing. They, yeah, they, they don't want to build a jail. <laughs> uh, I mean, literally, we've spent, we've spent the last couple of years, we, we have literally exhausted every effort with the, you know, partnering with the state. We, we've even looked at different educational programs. If we offer you know, different programming in the jail, would there be any funding? And there's just not. Uh, I remember I was in the basement of the current jail with Sheriff Gower, and he was kind of showing me some of the things. And, and since that time, it's been seven years, uh, I, I think I've been to eight, ten meetings about this issue. And I'm hearing from people who are like, well, why are we hurrying in, in such a rush to get this done? Um, maybe we can come up with a better idea. And I, to me, it's just how much hubris does it take to jump in at the 11th hour to an issue this complex and think that you're going to come up with an idea that hasn't already been examined to death and realize that it's not going to work? Uh, it just blows my mind. And, and you know, we, we've heard that over and over again, and I've spoken to a lot of those people personally and said, please, if you have a better idea, please. We, I mean, we've, we've literally, I've been involved in this since, since 2016. And so. when you ran in 2016, I mean, you ran on a platform of higher taxes and, you know, government spending, that this is what you wanted to do uh, as a county commissioner, right? No, this, is, <laughs> this is miserable. Never in a million years would I think that I would be in a, in a position to have to look at a tax increase. I mean, this is, this is not what I'm about. Because when was the last time the county commission raised taxes? Uh, we're not actually sure. Uh, we, we don't have record. It's been in excess of 20 years since there was a, a, a tax increase to the general fund. Now people, the amount that people pay in taxes has increased. Yes. As a result of their value of their property increasing. Yes. So if you pay 
2% on your property and your property is now worth twice what it was. Yes. Yeah. That's you're, you're responsible for that. And, right? and it's super confusing because you, you, we are paying more as far as our property tax. But if you, if you look at it as, as percentages, as values go up property, the percentages actually go down. So when I talked about that piece of the pie, that 10% piece of the pie, it, it's adjusted to where we receive that same amount of money, no matter how much property tax you pay. That that's our cut. That the only way that that deviates is with new growth. Right. And, and for instance, this last year, you know, it, we have a thirty percent growth. The the actual increase to the county because of that growth is about two hundred thousand dollars, which. And that you have to pay extra stuff and, to handle that. And growth. we have to pay all sorts of extra stuff. We have extra roads. Uh, you know, we've got to keep up with wages with our employees. You know, the, the sheriff will, will tell you he was bleeding from his department recently. And, you know, we were able to, to make some adjust, adjustments to the wage scale to keep our employees because it costs so much more to bring on new employees and onboard them, you know, whether it's the sheriff's office or across the board, right. it's much more economical to keep our good employees. And, and so that's something that we, that we, we made a significant investment in, uh, with our money, which, you know, long story short, uh, that took away some of our available funds to be able to put into the jail in the first place, which has necessitated this, this increase. This I love bond. when I hear, I talk to people and, you know, they say, well, our, you know, inflation's high. I, my employer needs to give me a raise. And then you tell them, well, you know, the, the county employees need a raise. Why, why do those county employees need a raise? Right. They're, they're public servants. They don't need to get paid a, <laughs> a, a living wage. Why should we <laughs> increase well, their wage? Right. And then, and then the sheriff lost 22 deputies in a 10 month period that we had to replace, which cost us literally over a million dollars of an excess just to bring on those new folks and to train them. Yeah, it's, people don't understand the training cost that goes in, no, uniform I, costs and yep. insurance and everything that goes into that. No, and you know what, our, our county employees are awesome. We, we've had very little turnover, even though you know, we're kind of at the bottom of the rung as far as what we pay our employees compared to other counties and municipalities across the state. We've got really dedicated employees that really have made this county run on a shoestring budget. Uh, but we just can't do that anymore. I've gotten a little irked in this whole process because I know I know Ken, I know you, I know Paul Cousins, I know Marilyn. Marilyn was here just 20 minutes ago. Um, and I know your, your hearts and I know your records and the thought that you're looking to screw people over, the thought that you're somehow financially and fiduciarily benefiting from this whole process, the abuse that's been heaped on you is, it's rankled me quite a bit. Uh, and one of the things I've been called is a bootlicker and you know, that's, uh, they need to do material for that one. Um, but one guy said, well, you know, we know you're in the pocket of the sheriff's office. Ken, have, have the sheriff's office ever paid me a dime? Not a dime. Yeah. I, mean, I can tell you neither a Cedar City PD or any other agency in the state of Utah. I don't work for agencies in the state of Utah. So, um, but uh, you know, that kind of vitriol that's out there. I mean, I hate taxes. You hate taxes. We all hate taxes. And on a federal level, where we see so much waste, yeah, I would I would be rankled with a 10% tax increase. You know that that would just drive me insane. But we've really been pretty good stewards of the money in this county, haven't we? We have, and and, and I have to give credit back to to past commissions. Have been super conservative. In fact, that's the reason that we were able to pay off all of our other bonds, you know, our small bonds early and really put us in a financial position to qualify for the terms that we have in this project. You know, we're looking at a 4.6% interest rate. We're looking at flexible terms as far as being able to retire this bond early. You know, and, and that's really amazing in this current, you know, economic economic disaster. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> yes. Uh, 
and and so we really have been fiscally conservative and that's the reason you know we were able to set aside 20 million dollars up front knowing that we that that would help mitigate the burden to the taxpayer uh, to get the favorable terms that we have for this bond and be able to move forward with as little effect to the taxpayer as possible now i've heard people say um why don't we just remodel the current jail yeah well, yeah, and that's a, that's a great question. That's one of the first things that we looked at was the possibility of remodeling. But first off, you have to keep in mind that remodeling a jail is not like remodeling any other commercial building or a house or anything like that. You know, our floors are two feet thick concrete reinforced with rebar. Our walls are eight to ten inches thick reinforced with rebar. Through all that concrete runs all the, the uh, conduit for all the electrical, for all the security, uh, all the sewer lines, all that is running through through this concrete and there's only one way to get it out and it's to tear it up. So when we when we had a designer look at the, the feasibility of, of remodeling it, they came back and said it was going to cost us 15 to 25 percent more to remodel than it would uh, just to, to build a new facility. And that's, and that's to keep it at the same capacity. And that's, and that's to keep it at the same capacity. In order to increase the capacity, we run into a couple of problems. One is we really don't have any room. People look at our front lawn and say, well, go ahead and build out on the front lawn. Well, there's actually an aqueduct that runs underneath that front lawn that prevents us from being able to put anything on that front lawn. And that's why that lawn is there. Uh, you know, we, we really don't have any space. And, and back when the jail was first built, the city put a conditional use permit on that facility that said that we couldn't go outside of that existing footprint. So, <clears throat> in, in, so by the time you look at, at the cost of first having to build someplace else, move inmates, and then... Where do you put all those inmates? Well, Beaver will it, take them, right? I heard that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, and that's the thing is, is we have no place else to put them. We've we've talked to the surrounding counties; they're not willing to take them. They've got their own their own problems, their own issues. They're not going to take our inmates for us, uh, you know, by state law and by constitutional mandate. As a sheriff, I'm required to provide a jail for our county and for all law enforcement agencies within our county. You know, that rests solely upon me as the sheriff. So having 300 and some beds per pod, if we just built one pod, how long would that last us? I estimate about 10 years. And that's part of the problem is, yeah, we could save $20 million by only building one pod instead of two pods right now. But within about a 10 year period of time, we would only have paid on this bond for about 10 years of a 30-year bond, and we'd have to bond again to build a second pod. And it'd probably we, be $40 million it, in it, 10 years. It'd probably be closer to $50 or $60 million in, at that time frame. Now, the, yeah. building the second pod allows us to bring in contract inmates. Correct. That is estimated to bring the county, what, $8 million? It would bring in... R roughly between 13 and 14 million dollars but, uh, but on by top the, of but by costs. the time by the time we paid you know the additional cost of employees by the time we paid the maintenance then it would it would be about 8 million dollars and that 8 that million dollars can be paid on to the geo bond absolutely that's you know and that's the plan to have that that additional revenue from those contract inmates go back into the bond and be able to pay the bond off early. Well, why don't we just build three pods and <laughs> pay that bond off even earlier? Yeah. We, as we've had these different, you know, you talked about these different meetings you've been to, you know, different town hall meetings. Uh, that's come up in almost every meeting after people really- I know, because I'm the one asking it. Really, <laughs> you know, the, the people that, that really, you know, once they figure out the realities of it, it's, you know, why don't you build that extra pod? Uh, 
we don't need it right now, but the way that the, the that it's designed, that it's designed for a third pod, and all the infrastructure as far as the kitchen, the laundry, and everything else is actually built into the current proposed construction. So when it comes time to build that third pod down the road, we already have the laundry facility, we already have the kitchen facility, we already have the office space. So it's all expandable. So it's all expandable. And the, that the top pod. floor of the main building, not the pods, but the main building is pretty much empty. Correct. Right and that now, can be rented, rented to an agency? Yeah, right now the plan is, is just to shell that out for future uh, growth of the, the sheriff's office as, as you know, the jail is going to grow, so as the sheriff's office, as our community continues to grow, we're going to need additional space. I mean, it's like where we're at right now. 37 years later, we've outgrown the sheriff's office space as well. We have no place else. So that could be FBI, go. that could be state police, yeah. that could be the county attorney, all would rent that, right? Yeah, which would be more revenue. Yeah, there's a possibility right. for more revenue, absolutely. Um, the other thing, we're, and we're looking at a couple of other things. So the sale of the current jail property, uh, and we don't know what that's going to look like, but once we've moved out of there and we don't need that property anymore, the plan is to sell it, whether that's as is or whether that's knock down the, the jail portion and leave the office building portion or whatever that is. Or just scrape the whole thing. And, and we'll figure that out with the market, with you know real estate folks when that time comes. But the plan is to sell that that seven acres of commercial property on Main Street and a hundred real estate and a hundred percent of that proceed go back in to pay off the bond. So you know that uh, that's one avenue. Uh, so eighty nine million dollars is the most that this project could cost. Can't cost any more than that. Yes, as far and as far as the bond and far, as far as what we borrow from right. the taxpayers. Yes. You have some money aside and, and put aside. Yes. And then $153 on a $405,000 house is the most that a, a taxpayer is going to have to pay more. Yes. But it's probably going to be less than that. Yes. So it's going to be around $12 a month, which is, I mean, good grief. <laughs> it's, yes. You know... It, that, that's nothing. Right. That's nothing. So, hey, gentlemen, I, I really appreciate you guys coming in and explaining this so that people can really understand. Ballots are in your mailboxes right now, and on those ballots, you're going to find a couple of propositions. Uh, the one that we're talking about today is, you know, for the Iron County Commission to borrow up to $89 million. I'm, I'm sold on it. You guys have sold me. I think that you should go out, you should get your ballot, and you should support this. Because I have one more question. If this doesn't pass, what happens? Well, crime continues to go up because we've, we have no other choice but to return certain inmates back to the street. So our crime rate continues to go up. We continue to send a message out that hey, if you want to commit crime and not go to jail for it, come to Iron County. You know, that's the message that we're sending. Uh, and this, the second part of it is, is this isn't going away. This is something that we are required to do. We have to do it. Well, we didn't this happen 37 years ago? It did. Didn't the, the voters turn down a jail bond 37 it, years ago for this it, current jail? It, it wasn't the voters. It was the... Uh, the problem between the county commission and the sheriff's office, and it ended up in, and I guess the county auditor, but it ended up going to the Utah Supreme Court, and the Utah Supreme Court said that the jail at that time was in uh, dire need, and the, the Utah Supreme Court ordered that the new jail be built. So if the voters turn this down, the, the need is still there, there's a potential for a couple million dollars in lawsuits for civil rights violation when you start putting people on floors. Well, and it'd probably be a lot more than a couple million as far as civil rights violation lawsuits go. And then the courts could come in and say, you're going to do this anyway. Right. Right. At, at a higher cost because yeah. it's what seven million dollars every year we delay well, six, six, six to, ten. to ten. They're estimating <laughs> six to ten, and I know, and unfortunately, and I've I've tried to be really honest in the answer of this question every time it comes up, and it comes up every single time we talk to somebody, and I've tried to just be brutally honest, if, if the bond doesn't pass this year, 
most likely we're going to have to come back a year from now and probably go the truth and taxation route, uh, which is going to, to be a permanent tax increase. It's not something that's going to fall off at the end of the bond being paid. Uh, it's something that the, the terms aren't as favorable. Uh, we're, we're going to have to ask for more than that $153 a month. Uh, because again, it's a need, it's not a want. We, we have to provide this service constitutionally. Um, we cannot kick it down the road any further. The cost just continues to go up. Uh, we believe that, that this option, the geo bond right now, is the most favorable option that we're going to get as far as the taxpayers and the bang for the buck and the, the, the least amount of money that we're going to have to ask for. If this kicks down the road another year, uh, yeah, we're looking at a six to $10 million increase and it's just not going to go away. And it continues the, the length of time that it's gonna to take to get this built and be able to move out of the old jail. And I, I hear people all the time say, well, just build tent cities like Sheriff Joe. And yeah. I, I, can't, I tried to look up and I, I got conflicting numbers. Sheriff Joe cost the taxpayers of Maricopa County between 200 million and 400 million, depending on which number, in civil lawsuits Correct. that were filed against him for his tent cities, because you know, 120 degrees in Phoenix and, and uh, you got inmates out there, but we, we can't, that's not even feasible when it well, drops I mean, below zero. I was gonna say, we have minus 20, minus 30 degree weather here, so what do you want, 120 or minus 30? Yeah, I, well, people die. I right. mean, you're, you're not gonna survive in it. Yeah. Right, and, and it's gonna cost the taxpayer a whole lot more to go out and do a tent city than it is just to, to do things lawfully and, and humanely and, and build a new facility. Not to mention, I mean, I believe in the Constitution. You sworn an oath to the Constitution, and prisoners have rights, just like we have rights. And you may not like that, but it, it is constitutional rights. You know, this is interesting. This has come up. This has come up a bunch of times. It's like, you know what, there's, there are people, and, and as a police officer, I can attest to this, there are a lot of good people that just do something stupid. Now, there are a lot of bad people that need to be gone for a long time, but, you know, not all of these people that are housed in our facility are these hardened criminals. Right. These, are, these are our neighbors. These are our, these are our friends' kids. Uh, you know, it, it, we need to treat them humanely. Um, I've stayed out of the jail uh, on as, as an inmate. I've been in several <laughs> times for other reasons, but but I've had friends and and neighbors who have had to pass through your your facility and spend a little time there. And yeah, they made mistakes. Well, you know, another thing that keeps coming is like, well, why are you going to build this Taj Mahal? Well, <laughs> I, and all all this is concrete. This is steel. The mattresses suck. I mean, they're they're a four inch mattress that feels like sleeping on a bag of rice. The, it, it is not comfortable. They, they don't have TVs. They don't have the, the creature comforts that we're all used to on the outside. I mean, it, it'll, it'll be nicely climate controlled and it'll be a, a much safer environment, but it's still a jail. It's still and there's a lot of people in your facility who've never been convicted of a crime. <laughs> Those that are being held on probable cause until, until they're tried. Yeah, so, but they you know innocent until proven guilty. That's right. And for, you know, they may be considered flight risks or not bailable or they just don't have the funds and, and they've never been convicted of a crime. And then I've heard people say, well, you know, just tie them to a ditch, you know, and let them poop yeah. in the ditch. You know? well, those people have a right to due process and they have a right to be safe and secure and, and be taken care of humanely during that due process. Well, I, I say rather than continuing to kick this can down the road for another decade, um, it's, it's time that we get it done, and it's going to cost us a heck of a lot more as taxpayers. I appreciate the, the commissions uh, being frugal and keeping our tax rate low. It's one of the things that's made this area so attractive to so many people and contributed to the growth. Maybe higher taxes will slow down our growth just a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> uh, one could always hope. But, yeah, I, I tell people all the time, this is something that we have got to do. It's time to do it. We can't keep pushing this off. And this was not popular for you in the commission to take on. I mean, you've no, been it, just lambasted. And, uh, yeah, and it's not pleasant. It's nothing that any of us wanted to have any part of. It's not, but, it, but it's a need. It's been kicked down the road 
you know, for years and years and years. Uh, and we've just reached a critical state with where we are now. And if we continue to kick it down the road, it's just going to cost more and be more of a burden on our taxpayers. Gentlemen, I appreciate you coming in and uh, sharing this important issue with us. The election in our area for uh, this year is November 21st. That's when your ballots have to be in. I always encourage everybody to go vote in person. Uh, you know, I don't know that there was election fraud in the 2020 election, um, but there was enough doubt that was raised that it really brings into question the whole electoral process. And I just encourage people to go to the polls on the 21st. You can go to City Hall. You can go to the courthouse in Parowan. Um, if you go to the Iron County uh, website, all of the, the polling locations are there. Go on the 21st and vote in person, and you never have a question. Um, you know, I like having poll watchers there and, and monitors there. Um, so I want to throw something out real quick. One of my and this is probably a little bit of disclosure, is uh, I'm the executive director of a, a nonprofit called the Friends of the Iron County Sheriff. We are currently in the process of Operation Wolf, and Operation Wolf is the uh, purchase of a explosives-trained canine. Right now, we have canines that are tracker dogs. Uh, the Sheriff's Department has canines that are drug dogs, but we are desperately in need of an explosives and firearms uh, dog. So we are currently having a fundraiser to raise funds, and we call that Operation Woof. And if you're interested in helping to contribute to that, you can go to friendsoficsheriff.org and click on the big bomb dog that's on there, and you can go and donate to that. What's currently happening is if we have a bomb report in a school or we have a firearm report in a school, we have to wait for another agency to the state or from St. George or Hurricane uh, or Washington County, and that creates a lot of time, and that time could potentially lead to tragedy. So by having that resource here in our own county, and not at the expense of taxpayers, but by the, the good people of Iron County uh, contributing, that we can potentially save lives. So we ask you to go and check out friendsoficsheriff.org and reach deep into your wallets and help us to bring that resource to Iron County. This has been Dan Kidder with the What's Really Happening in Southern Utah podcast, and we thank you for watching. Thank you for listening to What's Really Happening in Southern Utah, the podcast. We hope that you found this content to be worthwhile. We want to hear from you. So if you have any upcoming event that you'd like to share with our listeners, or if you represent a local group, we'd love to have you come into the studio. Just email us at contact at what's really happening su.com. We're also working on streaming this podcast live and have the ability for folks to call in and ask questions or share items of interest to residents of Southern Utah. Be sure to share this podcast with your friends. And again, thanks for listening.